In this video, I'm going to work out a simple example to help us better understand the difference between static and kinetic friction. A 10 kilogram crate is at rest on a horizontal surface. The coefficient of static friction between the surface and the crate is 0 0.4, and the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.3. Find the force of friction exerted on the block and the acceleration of the block in each case. So I'll be looking at three different cases. Case A, a force of 20 newtons applied horizontally to the right. Case B, a force of 40 newtons applied horizontally to the right. And then eventually, we'll look at a case C where an 80 newton force is applied at an angle above the horizontal. But let's start with part A. The first question you should ask yourself when dealing with either static or kinetic friction is uh, which one should you use? And the way that you would determine that is you would need to see if the force that's being applied to the block is enough to make the block move. If the force that's being applied is greater than the maximum value of static friction, then the block would move, the block would accelerate. And if the force is anything equal to or less than that maximum value of static friction, then the block will remain at rest. And so the way that we determine what that value is, is we write the equation, the force of friction the force of static friction, and really that maximum value of static friction is given by the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. And so in this case, we do have a 20 newton force that's acting to the right, but there's also the weight of the block which acts down and is equal to mg, and then a normal force which is equal and opposite pointing upwards which I'll label N. And then because this uh, applied force is to the right, the frictional force would point to the left. And in this case, we're not sure what kind of friction it is, but we are trying to determine what is that maximum value of static friction, which can be calculated using the coefficient of static friction and the normal force. So in this case, the coefficient of static friction was given to be 0 0.4 up above in the problem and the normal force is equal to the weight, which would be the 10 kilogram mass multiplied by 9.8. And so the maximum value of the static frictional force is about 39 newtons. And the reason why that's important to understand is applying a 20 newton force is a force that is less than 39 newtons, which means the block is not going to move. And in fact, if I applied a force of 38 newtons, the block would still not move. And so in this case, because the applied force is less than the maximum value of the static frictional force, the acceleration of the block will be equal to zero. The acceleration of the block is zero because the force that is being applied is not enough to overcome the static frictional force that is possible between these two surfaces. Now, I still have not calculated the actual uh, value of the frictional force bet between these two surfaces. And the, the way that I arrive at that value is pretty easy. Because the force is not large enough to make it move, the value of the force of friction, the force of static friction acting on this block, is exactly equal to the force that's being applied. And so the acceleration is zero, and the force of friction that is acting on this block is 20 newtons. At the end of the day, if we've now determined that this block isn't accelerating, it's not moving left or right, then we know that the 20 newton force pointing to the right needs to be balanced by a force of equal magnitude in opposite direction pointing to the left. And so the force of friction acting on the block in case A is 20 newtons and the acceleration is zero. Now clearly in case B, something different is going to happen. Here the force that's being applied is 40 newtons, which means that the force that's being applied is greater than the maximum value of static friction. Which means that when I apply that force of 40 newtons, the block should move. And so if the block is moving, 
if the block is sliding, the way that I calculate the amount of friction that's acting on that block is no longer due to static friction, but instead kinetic friction. And so the value of the frictional force acting on that block should be given by the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. And here, the coefficient of kinetic friction between these two surfaces was 0 0.3. And once again, the normal force is the block's mass times gravity, 10 times 9.8. And so in this case, uh, using the coefficient of kinetic friction, the value of the frictional force comes out to be about 29 newtons. So the frictional force is about 29 newtons. And under the influence of that frictional force, and the applied force, this block will experience an acceleration. But it's an acceleration due to the sum of those two forces. And so in order to determine what that force is, I should write a Newton's second law equation which says the net force acting in the x direction is equal to the object's mass times the acceleration in the x direction. And I know that if I define the uh, the right direction to the right as the positive x direction, then the 40 Newton applied force, capital letter F, is positive, and the frictional force, lowercase f sub k, is a negative force because it points to the left, right? This frictional force points to the left. And that's equal to the object's mass times the acceleration that is directed to the right. And so in this case, the acceleration is given by 40 minus the frictional force of 29 divided by the mass of the block, which is 10. And so that comes out to be about 11 divided by 10, which is something near 1 meter per second squared. And so the, ex the uh, crate has a, a very moderate acceleration of 1 meter per second squared. And so comparing the two problems that we've done so far, in the first case, we saw an example where the force that was being applied was less than the maximum value of static friction, in which case the block remained at rest, and the frictional force was equal to the applied force. <clears throat> in the second case, we saw that the applied force was larger than the maximum value of static friction, and so the block uh, is no longer in equilibrium, it begins to accelerate. And so as it slides, there's a force of kinetic friction, which is less than that applied force acting on it. And it's due to the sum of those two forces that the block experiences an acceleration to the right. And so, so far for parts A and B, I know what the acceleration is, and I know what the applied uh, force of friction is on this, on this crate. In this last example, part C, I'd like to have the force point at an angle so you can see how that adds a little bit of a challenge to some of the questions that we were dealing with in parts A and B. And so the first uh, step really in those first couple of questions was to figure out whether or not the force that was being applied was larger than the maximum value of static friction. And so if you remember, the maximum value of static friction, Fs max, was approximately 39 newtons. And if you have a good intuition for, uh, you know, vector triangles and uh, numbers, then you can probably look at this triangle and already tell me whether or not the force that would be responsible for the motion of this object uh, is larger than 39 newtons or not. But let's slow this down for a second and think about the question that I'm trying to answer. If I'm going to determine whether static or kinetic friction is acting on this block, this crate, then what I really need to determine is will the block move? But since the force is being exerted at some angle, it's a little bit hard for me to determine that. And so really what I need to decide is, is the x component is this horizontal component of the force that's being applied large enough to cause an acceleration of the block. And so I'll write Fx here. We'll refer to that as the x component of this force, 
and maybe there's a vertical component of this force that we can call Fy. And it's only the total force that's exerted at an angle that's 80 newtons. And if you remember your trigonometry, then you know that the x component of this triangle would be given by 80 cosine 30, 80 cosine 30, and 80 cosine 30 comes out to be something like 69 newtons. And if you tried to find the y component of this triangle, you would do 80 sine of 30 degrees, and you would get 40. So these are the two components of this triangle. Now, if you think back to how we calculated the maximum value of static friction, that 39 newton force, you'll remember that we used the coefficient of static friction and the normal force. And now let's think about what happens to the normal force when I uh, apply a force to the crate that is to the right and up. The other forces acting on this crate are the, the weight, which points downward, and the normal force, which points up. And I want you to think of, instead of having this crate just sitting on the ground, I want you to imagine it sitting on a scale that measures mass. And imagine pushing down on the crate and seeing that the mass read by the scale would be greater. And imagine lifting up on the crate and seeing that the mass read by the scale would be less. And that scale, what it's really measuring, is the amount of force that it has to apply in order to lift you up. And so when I apply a force, like this 80 newton force that's 30 degrees above the horizontal, part of that force is simply pushing to the right. It's pushing to the right in the same way that those other applied forces push to the right. But a component of this force, Fy, 40 newtons of this force, is pushing up, pulling up on this crate. And when that component of that force pulls up on the crate, the ground doesn't have to do as much work in order to hold that crate up. What I'm trying to say is that the vertical component of this 80 newton force lessens the normal force. It decreases the normal force. In fact, if we were to draw a separate free body diagram, we would see that the weight points down mg and there are actually two forces that point up the normal force and fy and in order for the block to remain in equilibrium it's the normal force plus fy that have to balance out the weight of the block and so the the more i pull up on the block the less n becomes and so in this instance if i wanted to do this problem carefully really what i should do is calculate a new value of the maximum static frictional force. And that would be the value of static friction, which was uh, for the coefficient, which was 0 0.4 times the new normal force. And in order to find that new normal force, I think it's going to involve a little bit of, of calculation. I know that in the y direction, the forces must add up to 0 because the block is remaining at rest, it's not accelerating upward. And what that means is that the normal force and the vertical component of the applied force, which point up and are positive, minus the weight of the block should add up to zero. Therefore, the normal force is given by the weight minus Fy. And if the mass of the block was 10 kilograms, and the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8, and the vertical component of the force was 40, then 9.8 times 10 is 98, minus 40 is 58 newtons. And so the new normal force is 58 newtons. So going back up above, I should be able to calculate a new value for the maximum static frictional force, and that would be 0.4 times 58, which is about 23.2. So let's just say it's about 23 newtons. And so notice, due to the upwards pulling from that applied force, which lessens the normal force, the maximum value of static friction was also lessened. 
I don't think that uh, what I've done is immediately required in order to solve this problem. Originally, the x component was 69, which was much larger than the maximum value of static friction. And by pulling up on the block, that's only going to lessen the maximum value of static friction. And so I should have known from the onset that this calculation was not necessarily required. In fact, I knew already that it had to be kinetic friction acting on the block because I knew it was going to slide because 69 is already larger than 39. And so to go back to the problem, I know now that the force of friction acting on the block is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. And so I guess I was going to need the value of the normal force anyway since I would need it for this calculation. And so the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.3 and the value of the normal force is 58 newtons. And 0 0.3 times 58 comes to be about 17 newtons. And so what this means, to boil it down into its simplest terms, there is a 69 newton force pointing to the right, and there is a 17 newton force pointing to the left. The x component of the applied force to the right and the, com and the force to the left is the force of friction. And again, it's due to the sum of these forces in the x direction that gives us the acceleration in the x direction. So really, fx minus the frictional force, that kinetic frictional force, is equal to the object's mass times its acceleration. And so we've already determined that kinetic frictional force, and so we can simply say 69 minus 17 divided by 10 would be equal to the acceleration of this block. And I believe that comes out to be something close to maybe a little bit north of 5 meters per second squared. And so this is quite a large acceleration, which seems to make sense because when I look at the free body diagram, the 69 newton force is much larger than the 17 newton force. Here the value of the force of kinetic friction was 17 newtons, and if you refer back to part B, we found a force of kinetic friction that was only about 29 newtons, and so there's a big difference there. Now typically we say, no matter what force I apply, the moment I get that crate moving, the force of kinetic friction will be the same. And that would be true if we weren't comparing two different cases where the normal forces were different in each case. And so here, in addition to understanding some of the problem-solving things that I mentioned, how to determine if it's static or kinetic friction, I think one big thing comes out of the third part of this problem. And that is, if I pull up on an object, then what will happen is the normal force will be reduced, it will go down, and as a result, the force of friction will go down. And if the normal force goes down, causing the frictional force to decrease, then the acceleration of an object could increase. And so that pulling up helps the motion of the crate. And if I push down, if I push downward, then that will result in the normal force increasing, which will result in the frictional force increasing, which will result in the acceleration decreasing. This is an example where a force acting in the y direction, which affects the normal force, actually does have an effect on stuff that's happening in the x direction. And so those motions are not completely independent because they're linked to one another in the frictional force acting horizontally on the block and the normal force acting vertically on the block.